Hey guys, in today's video, I am talking about the eight essential factors that you need to understand before hiring me. So if you are thinking about buying property, a vacation property, relocating here, coming to Park City, Utah, you know, whenever I sell a property, I have, you know, a marketing presentation, a listing presentation. I sit down and I meet with the owner of the home. That is very similar when you buy something in Utah. In Utah, we are one of the only states where you actually have to have three documents legally signed before any agent can represent you on a transaction. And I do realize that we're kind of unique in that way. And I didn't even realize that other states didn't do this. Like I thought every state did this, but apparently they do not. So in this video, this is what we're going to go through. Agency representation and paperwork, search platforms and criteria, how I get compensated, how agents get compensated. Timelines. Do you have to sell another property first? Contract process terms and deadlines for Utah. Current market conditions, complex offer terms and expectations and communication. Now, this is something that I do with every single buyer that I work with. And I... In the past, most transactions have gone much, much smoother when I have been able to book a Zoom call somebody with somebody, sit down and review all of these things. And we're in a changing landscape in real estate and things are really, really changing. And so you're going to see a lot more agents pushing buyer broker agreements on you, wanting to sit down, wanting to chat with you, wanting you to pick an agent, to commit to an agent, having you sign documents before you go into properties. There's just been a lot happening in the real estate industry and it's changing rapidly. And so it makes me want to be very transparent with you on how I operate my business, what I expect from you, what you can expect from me, what it's going to be like to work with me and legally what you actually have to sign before I can even represent you. So it's basically, this is how you become a client and not just a customer. So in Utah, we have, this is real estate terms, it's called agency representation. When you buy a property, if you're a seasoned vet, you know there's a buyer's agent, there's usually a seller's agent. Um, some states have outlawed what they call dual agency or limited agency, and that would be when and one sole agent represents both a buyer and seller. There are a lot of people that think that how could you ever be in the best interest of each client? And I agree, it you can't be, you become neutral. So I think in for the consumers, for the public, it's always best if um, you know, the person selling their home, the homeowner has their own representation, and the person buying a home has their home, their own home, their own representation. So legally, there are three documents that must be signed in the state of Utah before you can even write an offer on a home. One is a buyer broker agreement. Two is a buyer due diligence checklist. Three is a wire fraud disclosure. And four, my company actually has an affiliated business disclosure because we are affiliated with Mountain Metro, Mountain Metro Mortgage as well as Metro Title. So when you go with Berkshire Hathaway, when you choose me, partner with me as your agent, I do have vendors that I can refer to you. and they just want to disclose that, hey, we are in partnership with these people. We do have a partnership with Mountain Metro Title Company. And they're amazing, by the way. So the summary, so the very first document that you are going to have to sign before I can legally even represent you, give you any sort of advice on a property, advise you in any way is called the Exclusive Buyer Broker Agreement. Now, what it's going to have in here is my compensation, the location, are we writing this buyer broker to represent you in a specific county? Are we only doing it for specific properties? Things like that. In this buyer broker, there are no exclusions. So you can't come to me and say, you know, I send this to you, I allow you to review it. And you're going, well, Nicole, if I buy over in Red Ledges, I already have an agent. That would be an example of an exclusion. So really it's saying, look, you're going to be loyal to somebody, right? If you're buying a property in St. George, I don't need to represent you in St. George. But if you're buying a property in the Wasatch Back, you can't say, well, I'm using one agent to buy something in Jeremy Ranch, one agent to buy something in Deer Valley, and one agent to buy something in Promontory. That would be an example of an exclusion. I think a lot of people don't realize that we actually do not get paid unless we find you a property. This agreement is also cancelable. So in the case that you don't find a property, something changes in your life, we're not jiving together well, whatever it is, this is an agreement that can be canceled. 
There is a protection period on here. So any properties that I do show you, I am protected on those. And that is just a wise business deal. There's also a section in here that is called Seek the Professional, right? I'm a sales agent. I'm trained in the sales of real estate marketing, not home inspections, not legal advice, not tax advice, not financial advice, not construction advice, not building advice. So you really need to seek out the source of the source. You really need to seek out that, sp that specific specialty, that specific individual, but I can be the source of the source for you and provide you with referrals if you need some if you need help finding somebody. This goes with insurance too, right? I can't insurance is not my specialty. Mortgages are not my specialty. I refer you to a lender. I don't even talk about what interest rates are happening today. You need to seek out the professional. The next one is the buyer due diligence checklist. There are 24 items on here. Every single buyer has a different pet peeve, has a different material concern. This is just sort of a reminder of hey, you may want to know about these things during your due diligence. There are 24 items to sort of keep in the back of your mind what's really important to you. Obviously, a home inspection, maybe an appraisal in Park City that's going to be HOA fees, real estate transfer fees, any sort of special assessments you're going to want to know about, HOA documentation, contacting the HOA personally, talking to the HOA, getting those questions answered. Also, do you need a survey on the property? How much is it going to cost to remodel the property? Do you need to bring a contractor in? Are there any specialty items we need to look at for someone to repair certain items after a home inspection has taken place? Also, solar panels on a roof, are they leased? Are they owned? Is the seller planning on paying them off at closing? Is this something that they expect you to take on? Is this another expense? There's a lot of little hidden things that can happen during due diligence and every buyer has a different pet peeve. Also, a lot of people want to know the school district or how long it's going to take to commute somewhere to a new job or um, a lot of people want to do their research on the schools or the community. I always recommend if you want to know about the community, go there in the morning, go there in the evening, go there in, at lunchtime, see who's walking around, see what kind of cars are driving around. That helps you get an overall feel of the neighborhood and of the community. Go to the local restaurant, see what kind of types of people are hanging out there. That gives you the best idea. I cannot tell you like certain things that violate fair housing rules and fair housing laws. So if you're asking me, does a certain religion, is this, is this county very heavy in this certain religion? Like I, I can't answer that for you and neither can any other real estate agent. That puts us at a lot of risk. There's also a wire fraud disclosure. Anytime you're wiring big, big chunks of money, you always want to call the source of who, wherever you got that from and get the wire transfer instructions over the phone to make sure that you are wiring money to the correct place. You never want to just receive an email and then wire money. You always want to call the person who gave it to you to verify the instructions. Seasoned vets, I worked with a lot of seasoned vets. I have clients that call me and are like, hey, Nicole, I'm at the bank. Is this the correct wiring? Or they call the, when, when the, when it, the time comes to actually wire the money for closing, you know, the title company is going to be sending you wire instructions. The funny thing is that this wire fraud disclosure says don't trust instructions by email, even if it is a secure email, and it usually is coming through an email. But, you know, red flags are if it's not your title company, if it's not your escrow officer, if things sound a little fishy, if the money's off, just be hyper aware of those things because bad guys are getting smarter and smarter and smarter, and they are hacking into people's emails and they're finding ways of taking money from people. There was an instance when somebody, somebody lost it. It was not my client. Um, it was, um, but it was in my brokerage. Somebody wired $70,000 because a bad guy broke into the real estate agent's email, pretended to be this person, was going back and forth with the client. The client didn't really catch on that something was weird. He wired this money and then the FBI ended up having to get involved. So we don't ever want that to happen. So the required documents, a buyer broker agreement, a wire fraud disclosure, and a buyer due diligence checklist are all things that I will go with you, go more in depth with you. When I do a buyer consultation, I'll actually go through line by line and read it with you. A lot of people are like, no, Nicole, we've already decided we want to pick you. No, just send us the documents to sign it. Please just let me go over it really quickly with you because it does explain how I'm compensated and there is a lot of need to knows in there. So kindly elaborate how you will be compensated for your services. So in the event that my compensation offered is below my standard fee, how do we proceed, right? So I charge 3%. 
If you are buying a property that is 2%, 2.5%, 2.8%, then generally the rule of thumb would be you as the buyer would have to make up the difference to pay that 3%. Now, there are ways of asking for it. I don't want you to freak out because I would never want to be the reason that somebody did not get a house. But there are ways of asking a seller for it. There are about three documents, three addendums, three forms. We can always ask a seller or the listing broker to cover the remainder half a percent, 0.2 percent, percent, whatever it is in the event that um, my the compensation that they have decided to offer is below my standard fee. So this goes the same for if you're buying something that is off market or it's a for sale by owner property, right? When you walk into an open house, um, like if you're buying something that's off market, that's a for sale by owner, right? We're going to have to use those forms or either you're going to be the one paying the fee or we're going to have to ask the seller to pay the fee to cover it. To And, and it sounds bad. It sounds like the seller is paying my fee and I represent you. What's really happening is you as the buyer are paying for everybody's fee, but it's just being dispersed right? It's being dispersed through that big chunk of money. And what happens is a listing agent and a seller sit down and this listing agent says, this is my fee. And the seller goes, okay, I'm either willing to pay you that or I'm not willing to pay you that. And they negotiate, right? Whatever X amount commission is negotiated upon that now that listing agent, that listing broker can say, okay, well, in order to incentivize people to come and sell your property and help me sell this property, I'm going to offer another agent a percent of my compensation. That could be 4%. That could be 3%. That could be 2.5%. So that listing agent has decided that I'm going to share what you, Mr. Seller, have just agreed to pay me if a another agent brings a buyer to your property. So I really want to be really transparent on how those types of commissions work, on how real estate agents are paid. I think we in the real estate industry, there have been a lot of bad agents who have said, I'm free. The seller pays me. No, we are not free. We are absolutely not free. You as the buyer are paying us, but rest assured, you're paying us in a way that comes out of the proceeds of the purchase price of the home. And it's being dispersed that way, right? It's the same thing that if you as a seller, if you have a lot of debt to pay off to sell your house, that's how your mortgage gets paid off. You're not hiring a listing agent and giving them a retainer or paying them hourly. You're paying your listing agent out of the proceeds of the home that the buyer is paying you. So I want to make sure that's really, really clear because there's a lot of controversial issues in our business and you bring up commissions and people's heads spin around and snot flies out of their nose and they lose their minds. So I've never had problems with people who are affluent and sophisticated, who buy and sell lots of property. Like they're usually like, yeah, we, we get it. We understand it. We hope you sell a huge house. It's people that are not as familiar with the real estate process. They don't buy and sell a lot of real estate. They're not used to paying a broker fee. You know, they're maybe more for sale by homeowners, um, things like that. But what I've noticed is that people who are very affluent, very sophisticated, generally do not have a problem with this. And they're usually the people that can afford to pay their agent, right? Um, maybe they don't want to, but the volume that we do in Park City, I mean, if somebody had to pay their agent all 3% of a, um, had to pay their agent 3% the entire fee because it, it, there was zero compensation being offered, I mean, that could become 150 thousand dollars depending on the purchase price because our volume is so crazy up here. Now that could be, present a problem. You already have a buyer who's doing a down payment, who's paying for the HOA fees, the closing costs, the transfer fees, and you have a seller that's not splitting that with them, not giving them any concessions. I'm just saying, let's say the seller isn't doing anything for you as a buyer. They're not splitting anything from you. I mean, that can get really pricey as a buyer and you're the one paying for everything. So I think sellers need to be aware of that. They really need to be aware of that. Okay. Oh, what is the procedure when you walk into an open house, new development or sales gallery for information? So let's say that we do not have a buyer broker signed yet. Um, you're still a little bit, you're still kind of a little ways out. I always tell people when you're like, when, when you're ready within six months to do this, 
then let's sit down. Let's have the video call. Tell me about, I want, I like to get to know the people that I'm working with. So tell me everything that you're looking for, your budget, your time frame, what neighborhoods you really like. And then let me educate you on the services that I actually provide for you, what I actually do for you and how I'm compensated. So there's absolutely, there's, there's a ton of transparency and there's no, um, no hiccups. When you are walking into an open house, a new development, or like a sales gallery, and I am not present with you, and you want me to represent you as your agent, even if we don't have a buyer broker signed yet, but you say, no, 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 Nicole's our agent, like Nicole's our real estate agent, you kindly need to let whoever is helping you know that. You walk into Promontory without me to go tour Promontory, you need to let their sales team know that you are already working with an agent or else they are going to put you into their system. They take notes on you. They know when you walked in. They know who gave the tour. They know every single name of your family member. And then one, what ends up happening is that now you send me an email saying, oh, we want promontory. So now I go register you as my client and I get a email back from their sales staff saying, oh, we are the ones that toured Mr. Blah, 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 Mr. X on so-and-so date with their family. And some of these agents will make you the the client, the the buyer, actually send an email to them saying that you want to work with me and not with them. So it becomes a little bit of whose client is who, right? And I've had a lot of people who have been looking for homes for the past three years. And I'm not going to make you sign a buyer broker when you're still, you haven't decided on anything in the last three years. Your neighborhoods are changing. Your preferences are changing. The property is changing. Your budget is changing. But if you also don't update me on that criteria and don't let me know about that, then you're going to keep getting the same stuff until you clue me in onto your if your budget's updated, if your criteria is updated, and you know if you're still interested in buying a house up here. Um, so let's move on. So if you do walk into an open house, a sales gallery, or like an ivory homes development, a homes homes development, a Lennar home development, any home builder, and you're speaking directly with their sales agent and I am not present with you and you want me to represent you, then tell them you have an agent. If not, then don't tell me you have an agent. But if you want to work with me down the line, it could present a little bit of a, a friction if you end up wanting to buy there. Just a heads up. Search platforms. So you're really probably familiar with search platforms. So I have my own app. There's also um, my website, Berkshire Hathaway's website. You guys are probably familiar with homes.com, Zillow, Redfin, Realtor. You're probably searching for a homes on here somewhere, right? So basically, I'll do an auto listing setup with you. If there are conversations that need to be had in the future because you're still someone who hasn't bought anything for three years, then please update me on your criteria and your preferences and your budget as it evolves down the line. Um, I have, again, an agent-specific app, which is a direct connection to the MLS. I also use a service called Real Scout, which is really great. I think people um, respond really well to it because it's it feels like Zillow. And then there's also the Berkshire Hathaway Utah website. The financing process. So using a local lender versus not using a local lender versus not sure a local lender <laughs> versus not using, there's a typo in there, versus not using a local lender. Here's the reason why. So lots of people who are super sophisticated and fancy people, a lot of times you guys have your own lenders, which is great. No big deal. No problem. Um, but if you end up buying something that is like a hotel condo, like St. Regis or Montage or Pendry or something like that, you need to have a discussion with your lender because the last thing that we want to happen is for you to go to contract on a property that they actually will not finance. Um, there are uh, resort specific financing is very um, difficult. And I know a lot of local lenders who will will loan on this type of product. So I don't know if your specific lender would, if you're somebody who kind of has their own lender, you buy and sell a lot of properties. Now, if you're somebody who needs a local lender, I have a bunch of referrals that I can give you. You can check them out, see who you like best. If you are buying in cash, right? This year, I've only had one, two, one deal where it was not a cash deal. Um, so 
buying in cash, you need a proof of funds letter. So before we submit offers, we need a proof of funds letter. That could look anything like screenshotting your account and just blacking out the information you don't want them to see. It could also be going to your financial advisor or going to your bank and having them write a letter that says, you know, Mr. Smith has the funds in his account to cover, you know, the purchase of this property. When we wait till last minute, what ends up happening is I had a really, I had a really cute client and they were screenshotting all of their accounts, right? Because their money was in different places. So now we have like five screenshots to compile the money to show the proof of funds. So however you feel comfortable doing that, that is your call, but we need some sort of documentation that shows that you actually have the funds to buy the property. Now, if you're not cash, you need a pre-approval letter. So we need to have, you know, be pre-approved before the, before we write the offer on the home, not after. So for the timeline, so we've got looking at homes versus writing an offer, counter offer, due diligence um, items, negotiating repairs or credits, financing and appraisal, settlement and closing. Earnest money, amount and timing. So here in the state of Utah, the earnest money is about 3% of the purchase price and you have four calendar days to deposit it. Not business days, calendar days. So this can come into play depending on the day of the week that you make an offer. You make an offer on a Wednesday, it gets accepted on a Thursday. Now we have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. You have till Monday, so you lose the weekend. You lose those two days over the weekend. Now, are there ways that we can ask to extend the deadline? Yes, but a seller has to agree to it. So this is money that needs to be liquid, easy to access. If it's in stocks, keep in mind, you're going to have to sell the stocks before you can get to it. Um, I had a little bit of a situation where my client, all of his money was in stocks. Um, Easter was happening. The banks were closed. I mean, we were a little nervous that um, his money was going to get there on time. It ended up working out great, but another little bump in the road if you're not prepared. Your earnest money needs to be liquid. So if you are in the market for buying a house, you need to have liquid earnest money. And if it's all in stocks, then you need to be really thoughtful about um, getting that money out when it's actually going to become available and that four calendar day deadline. So contract process, terms, and deadlines. So there are actually 22 sections in the Real Estate Purchase Contract of Utah that need to be completely filled out with the utmost care. We can't have any blanks, mistakes, errors. It needs to be total accuracy, no missing initials, no missing signatures. It needs to be ironclad. So it's the name. How are you buying this as an LLC? Are you buying as a married couple, husband and wife? Are you buying... As a partnership, they need to see LLC documents. Is it a corporation? Keep in mind there, if you are buying as a husband and wife, whoever is buying the property, I need, unless you have like a power of attorney or something, I need everybody's signature. So if you're buying a husband and wife, you can't give me one email. I need both of your emails because each of you are going to have to sign the documents and have two separate emails. Earnest money is for calendar days, not business days. There's included items, excluded items. What's the purchase price? Are we conditioned upon buying another property? Meaning, do you have another property you need to sell before you can buy this? In that case, sellers do not love that, especially if it's not even on the market yet <laughs> or it hasn't sold yet or it hasn't passed due diligence. I highly, highly, highly recommend never make a contingent offer until you have passed the due diligence on your property. Um before you make an offer on a property. Because if something goes south with your property, then it's a domino effect on this property. And you could lose earnest money, you could lose deposits, you could end up defaulting, and it, be it be could become a mess and a domino effect. Um, possession. How long do you are we going to do possession upon recording? Three days, one day? How many days are you giving? Are you comfortable with giving a seller to move out? So possession is basically when you get your keys. Um, special assessments, future assessments, current assessments, HOA, transfer fees, these types of things. Are we going to, are you okay with paying them? Do we want to ask the seller to split them with you? Are we going to ask the seller to pay them, right? It's all a negotiation. Um, that goes into change of ownership fees. Who's going to pay this? We want to know who's going to pay this. The due diligence deadline. So we're going to have a due diligence deadline, a financing and appraisal deadline, 
if you're financing. Um, if you're cash, maybe you still want to get an appraisal. So we put an appraisal contingency in there too. Um, if you're not worried about it appraising, maybe we wrap the appraisal into due diligence. So you make your offer stronger by just having one contingency on there, which is your due diligence deadline. And you make sure that you're getting an appraisal within that due diligence deadline so that if it comes back and you don't like it, that is something that you're not putting yourself at risk for um, having to cancel on and losing that earnest money. Um, home warranties, are we going to ask for a home warranty? Mediation, is this something where you're okay with going to mediation first? And then acceptance. Acceptance in, is when both parties, all the signatures have been signed, everybody's come to a meeting of the minds, and it's been communicated to each party that we are now under contract. Contract deadlines. So in Utah, we have our seller disclosure deadline, that's something you're going to want to go over and look at the seller's disclosures. You're going to want to maybe have give a hand over to your home inspector, have him look over those things. If there's anything in there that you have questions about, um, that'll usually, a lot of times it's going to reveal a lot. It's going to tell us the ages of a lot of the appliances, things like that. Um, the financing and appraisal deadline could may or may not be in there depending on how you're purchasing this house, um, the settlement deadline, and then a response period time. So how long are we going to give the other party to respond? I think it's really important to understand that Utah is a hard deadline state. We can So if they give you till 5 o'clock p.m. on Tuesday to sign and you sign at 6, we have to do a counter offer, right? There will be no acceptance if you sign after the deadline. Settlement versus closing. So this is different in Utah. Settlement is when everybody sign, every, both parties have to have all their documents signed and, and be present in the title office. You also have to have all of your cash to close wired by this day. The exception to the rule is that the lender doesn't have to have all the cash to close all the, all the funds wired by this day. So this can be confusing to some people because they can be like, we signed all the papers, we did everything. But if you're getting a loan and you signed on a Friday, generally recording won't happen until Monday. So that's something I always like to prepare people for. I always tell people, Hey, don't sign the day of settlement sign early. And a lot of people who are out of state, they sign remotely. You know, if your cash, it's, it's, it's a lot quicker um, wire the money a few days early so that it gives the title company the day of to do everything they need to do. If everything happens kind of on that day of, sometimes like, yes, you're not in default because everything got there, all the documents were signed, but they didn't have enough time to do their thing. And so you might not close till the next day, right? We record till the next day. So I always th say sign the documents a little early, especially sign early if you are um, out of state signing remotely and getting a loan because you're going to have to have a remote notary come to you and email back the original documents. Like the title office, the title company has to have the original documents back to their office on the day of settlement. You don't want those documents to come back the day after settlement. They need to be there on the day of. So due diligence, we have HOA information, fees, transfer fees, rental agreement, short-term rental agreements, long-term lease agreements that affect the property, personal property transfer agreements. Are we asking for anything that is personal property? Is this property being sold fully furnished? Property management company information, home warranties, the title report, time is of the essence when signing docs. I just explained that to you. We want to talk about what... Um, uh, defaulting and what that means, um, both parties. Final walkthrough and delivery of keys. So something that I want you to know is that I cannot be present for you during the final walkthrough. You have to be here for your final walkthrough. If you cannot be present for the final walkthrough, you either waive your right to do your walkthrough, you need to rehire your home inspector to do it for you, or you need to fly back in to do it, or you need to have a friend or family member do it. Now keep in mind, if you have a friend or family member do it, I had a client that had his friend do it for him and he went through the final walkthrough and it was like we were reliving due diligence all over again, right? He's picking apart the house because his friend bought a brand new construction house. The my client had bought a house that was 30 years old, right? And so he was going through it. Well, this is like in my house, this is here. And I'm just going, the final walkthrough is not a rehash of due diligence items. It's to make sure that the property 
looks the exact same as when it went under contract, that it looks the exact same, that everything is working, that the dishwasher is working, that if we've agreed to any repairs, that they've been fixed. Or if we're just getting a concession for it, which I highly recommend, don't ask a seller to fix anything. Just ask for money. <laughs> that is my, then you can, then you can get things fixed the way that you want them and you can pick who you want to fix them. Otherwise, you ask a seller to do it, they're going to hire the cheapest person, do it for the cheapest amount of money, and do it the fastest. And then six months down the line, you're going to be laying in bed, and you're going to be like, oh, why didn't I let, I can't believe it. Who did he hire? He hired like the cheapest contractor to come and fix this. It's not repaired the way that you want it, and you're unhappy. So current market conditions and pricing, right? Clean offer terms versus complex offer terms versus aggressive versus just bad offers, right? There are some offers that are just bad. Whenever you have to sell a home first, oh, most sellers don't want to accept that. They absolutely do not want to accept that. The way that you can sweeten the deal is if the property that you're already having to sell before you buy this property is already under contract and you're already like past the due diligence or past the deadlines on your property where that buyer could pull out. If you're not past that yet, oh man, we are risking a lot, okay? So those types of offers are not a seller's favorite, right? Obviously, cash is king here. About 50 to 60, somewhere between 50 and 60% of Park City's market is all cash buyers. Um, you know, so, and there are just things that can go wrong with a loan, right? So, you know, but sometimes people get loans and it's, and it's good. You just want to make sure that you have a good lender on the other side. That's gonna, um, that's, that's good. We also want to know kind of, is it a buyer's market? Is it a seller's market in this neighborhood? Are prices going, you know, cause Park City is a very hyper local neighborhood. Every single neighborhood's different. Every single property type is different. Land is different. Condos are different. Townhomes are different. Single family homes are different. The neighborhood where you're buying these individual properties can vary, right? Land is really bad right now because there's a lot of it for sale because everybody bought it up during COVID. And then they decided because there was no inventory, right? And then they realized, oh my God, it's going to cost me you know, at least $700 a square foot to build. So the cost to build is outrageous. They can't find a builder. They can't find an architect. It's really expensive and they'd rather just buy a resale. So the cost of land is really high right now and there's a lot for sale. So land is a very difficult market right now. Um, and I'm telling you, the cost to build is outrageous up here. It is very, very, very high. Um, you're not going to find a builder who I mean, you're going to probably be paying between $700 and $900 a square foot, roughly, right? In some other areas in Deer Valley, it just depends on how fancy you are, right? There's someone in Promontory that's pinnacle of Promontory that's spending $2,000 a square foot to build his house, right? And he negotiated his luxury home builder down from $2,500 a square foot, right? So it depends on you and your finishes and your level of taste and how fancy you are. Um, you know, is it a buyer's market? It is the seller's market. If interest rates drop, could that instantly change our market? Because we used to be, you know, through this whole summer, our inventory was above a thousand. We finally dropped below a thousand. We're like at, I think we're at nine, I think we're in the nine eighties now. So our inventory has shrunk again. We're going into winter season. We're going into ski season. Our inventory is shrinking again. So we just don't have a lot of inventory, but High interest rates are keeping certain price points of our market very soft, specifically in the two percent, the two million to three million dollar range. That seems to be where everybody's getting a loan. So that area is a little bit soft, but it depends on the neighborhood that you're buying into because some neighborhoods in that price point could not be a problem. Some are a problem, right? The out of state process. So I think it's really important that I would say like 90% of my clients that I work with come from this YouTube channel and they're out of state. So these are my questions to you because I've been through it over and over again. I've experienced what kind of gives people, you know, people, um, what are little bumps in the process, what, what people, what people's, some people's irritations are. So, you know, are you going to be here to look at properties in person? Do you want me to video the properties for you? Do you want me to FaceTime properties for you? Are you comfortable making um, offers on properties sight unseen? Are you comfortable 
you know, making an offer on it, seeing it online. If I did a video tour for you, are you going to fly back in for due diligence if you're not here in person, right? I think there's different ways to look at this. You can either fly in for a weekend, go look at a bunch of homes and say, okay, out of these bunch of homes, we're going to buy one of these, right? We're going to make an offer on one of these homes. Or there's like, oh, we flew out. We looked at all these homes. We still couldn't find anything. Now you go back home, right? But you're still getting listings. I'm still sending you stuff. And now you see one, but you're not going to fly in to look at it in person. And you just want to get it under contract. You'll fly back out here to look at it during due diligence, right? I think also knowing that there are some sellers that could be hesitant to um, accept an offer when you haven't seen a property in person. And I mean, just put yourself in their shoes, right? Because they're like, oh, you're going to fly out for due diligence, but you haven't seen it in person. This is really the first time that you're seeing it in person. So fingers crossed, we hope you love it and you stay, you you stay under contract and don't cancel, right? Um, again, will you fly back in through your walkthrough? Are you going to be here in person? Um, or, or, or do you need to hire your home inspector again? Or are you going to have a friend or family member do it for you? You're going to waive the the walkthrough. Signing closing settlement statement paperwork, right? Are you going to be signing in person at the title office? Are you going to be signing from remotely? Again, planning ahead if you are signing remotely and getting a loan because the documents have to be mailed to the title office. So we need to be really on top of that timeline wise. Um, settlement versus cl closing and understanding the expectations of when you will actually receive your keys, right? If we got an agreed acceptance that you will receive your keys on recording, then boom, the minute the title company calls me and says, congratulations, I just recorded the deed, here's a copy of it, the property's yours. But if we gave them a day to move out or 24 hours to move out, then it would be 24 hours from them or 48 hours or 72 hours, right? Um, setting up utilities, I think this can be tricky for a lot of people because sometimes you have somebody has to be present at the house to do cable and internet and they don't say, hey, we'll be there at 2 p.m. on this date. They say, hey, we'll be there between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. on this date. And so are you going to fly back out again for that? Also, do you have to fully, is is there furniture included in the property? Is there not furniture included? Um you know, there's, there's going to be times where you're having to fly back out here several times. So I just don't want that to be a surprise, you know, when you're like plane ticket is a thousand dollars to come out here. So just being really transparent about, you know, thinking through this process, how many times do we want to fly out there? You know, how many times realistically are we going to have to fly out there? So being, you know, full expectation on that. Communication and expectations. You know, how do you want to be communicated with? How often? What time of day? What time? You know, are you like, please don't send me any texts or call me after 5 p.m.? Please don't, you know, call me on the weekends. You know, I would say if you don't want to be bothered on the weekends, then try not to make an offer, you know, on a Friday because we'll be negotiating all weekend long. And that, and then you'll be wrapped into this real estate thing all weekend. So keep that in mind. Like, how do you want to be communicated with? What days do you want to be communicated with? Once we're kind of in the process of writing an offer and negotiating, depending on, you know, how clean the offer is and how, how much back and forth we have with negotiations, you know, once you're in an offer, you've just kind of got to be present and ready to sign documents at all times. Um, you know, because I mean, what really happens? You say, oh, we want to make an offer at 2 p.m. on a Friday and then I can't get a hold of the, you know, the listing agent. And so then it doesn't, nothing gets signed till like 8 p.m. on a Friday and then we're not under contract till Saturday morning, right? So usually, I mean, it's usually like I want to make an offer at 6 p.m. on a Wednesday night, right? This is just the lovely nature of our game. So we have to be ready for anything. Um but I just want to, I just want to know, like, how do you prefer to be communicated with email? Are you okay with text, phone calls, those types of things? Um, buying a resale versus new construction. I think people who are really looking for a smoking deal <laughs> should not be looking in Park City, um, first off. But, you know, buying a resale versus new construction, I would say that you're definitely going to be able to negotiate more on a resale than you would on new construction. New construction, especially when it's a developer, when it's brand new product, when it's in Deer Valley, when it's at the new side of Deer Valley, um, when it's in a new development area like this, usually builders, like 
if they're having problems selling their properties, then they're just going to start offering incentives, right? They're not going to, they're not going, they're, they're really not going to be very negotiable with you because they have bills to pay and, you know, develop creating huge developments like this is no joke. They have a lot of pressure on their back and, you know, they'll just sell it to somebody else if you become too difficult to deal with. So I think really understanding that when you buy new construction, you really don't have a lot of negotiation ability, especially because those developers have their own repsies, have their own attorneys. It's not even state approved forms. It's their own real estate purchase contract for that project. So there are a lot of additional terms in those those projects. You know, if you don't sign on the day that is agreed upon, they charge you interest. Um, so there's a lot of little grenades that you need to watch out for, especially in those developer repsies, because they can be a little bit unfriendly sometimes, and they're definitely not going to favor you, the buyer. They're going to favor the developer because if they didn't favor the developer, then they wouldn't be able to do what they do. And, you know, we wouldn't have any new inventory and new projects. Um, so buyers of a, a uh, buyer agent benefit. So there are a lot of people who might be like, I don't need a real estate agent to buy real estate. No, you do not. You also don't need a real estate agent to sell real estate, right? I'm not talking to those people. I'm really talking to the people, you know, the 90% of people that do want their best interest represented, right? So here's kind of what we do for you, right? We get you into a property first. I know about off-market inventory. I know about new properties before they hit the market. My network of agents, right? Berkshire Hathaway is one of the top companies in Park City. We have majority of the developments up here. So I am well-versed on what's happening in the area, okay? And, you know, I know about certain properties that another brokerage might not know about because it's an from another agent inside our local brokerage. Um, hyper local market in, intel, right? When you use a Salt Lake agent to buy up in Park City, that could be bad news for you. It's like somebody hiring me to sell them a property in St. George. St. George is five hours away. I don't want to help you buy a property in St. George, right? Hyper local neighborhood expert right? My local market is really Park City and the Wasatch back. This is my expertise. I would be doing you a huge disservice because I don't know the St. George real estate market, right? And I, I don't need to get to know it. It's not my neighborhood. Um, so just keeping that in mind that you really, you're really going to benefit yourself by using a local neighborhood expert. Um, right. We've got connections with vendors, with title companies, with lenders, with, you know, interior designers, with contractors, with insurance people. What are the market conditions that are happening in our, our market? Because Park City is a bubble. It is completely different than the rest of the United States. And it's totally different than Salt Lake. It's even different than Heber. So the atmospheric market conditions of each neighborhood, again, like I said, Park City is a hyper local market. We are so different. You know, something that's happening in Park Meadows could be completely different than what's happening in Promontory or Lower Deer Valley or the Jordanelle. They're all very different areas. Each subdivision could be different. Oh, like these little, you know, condos, let's say like Mayflower Lakeside condos versus like a Fawn Grove in Lower Deer Valley, right? Each, there's so many little markets that are different. So what's happening in those, the atmospheric conditions of knowing like that local neighborhood market intel, right? Uh, representing a buyer's best interest, right? You're a fiduciary. Uh, negotiating terms, best the best terms for you on your behalf. I am a strong believer that a buyer and seller should never be meet face to face and should never negotiate directly. Why? Because emotions get really, really heightened. And, you know, I had, I've had a, I don't ever think a buyer should, you know, even call a listing agent directly. Like if you want me to represent you, let me be the one to call the listing agent for you. Because what ends up happening is then you get confused on like, well, who has my best interest? Because I, I talked to the listing agent and they told me this. Yes, but you have to remember that listing agent has a fiduciary duty to their seller, 
not to you as a buyer. So I want you to think all the way back into the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. There was no such thing as buyer representation. Everybody represented a seller. Even if you were like showing property your mother-in-law mother and you showed them a seller's home, you would like be representing the seller even though your mother-in-law was your client. Like it was totally just completely effed up, right? And there were so many lawsuits because buyers were getting screwed left and right that this is how we've kind of evolved the industry today. Everybody has their own representation. Do you need to be represented by an agent? No, you don't. Maybe you're sophisticated. Maybe you're really good at doing this and you just have an attorney. You hand it off to them. They do everything for you. Great. But um, 90% of people, they use a real estate agent. Um, I protect your deposits and your earnest money. We manor, manage the contract timelines from um, offer to closing, right? So once we're shopping for a home, once we find a home, we write the offer, we do the counter offers, the inspections, the seller concessions, the closing, the walkthrough, everything, right? So, and really we're, we're reducing your legal risk with local knowledge, with atmospheric conditions of the local market and, um, with risk and, you know, the knowledge of the forms that we're allowed to use. You know, all the forms are state approved forms by Utah. Again, every state is completely different where you're buying or selling real estate. Utah, you have to have three documents signed before you can even represent a buyer. Um, you obviously have documents signed when you represent a seller. So I can't believe there's other states where you wouldn't have a, a written agreement in place when you're representing a buyer. It's ludicrous to me, but apparently that is happening. So bravo, Utah, on um, being ahead of the curve. So what happens if you go straight to the listing agent, right? Well, I just pointed that out. Um, you go to Zillow. It's like request a tour, contact agent. You know when you click on these buttons that it's not taking you directly to that agent. It's taking you to someone who has paid a lot of money to Zillow to to appear on the first page of their sponsorships, right? So again, when you're going directly to the listing agent, if you have no intention of really having a buyer's, uh, your own representation by hire, having hiring a buyer's agent and you're going directly to the listing agent, just be aware, be very aware that they do not represent you. They represent the seller. So they don't have your best interests at heart, okay? They're not, there's a lot of things they're not going to tell you, okay? There's things they have absolutely have to disclose by law, but they don't represent you. So don't get confused with that. Okay. Um, I had a deal this year where it was an off market deal. It was a family member. Um, a house came to the market. It literally happened in five days. It was like a miracle from God. Um, my client went directly to the listing agent, basically told her her whole scenario, the story, everything, you know, and then I'm the one representing her. So what should have happened is I really should have been the one to call that listing agent because the listing agent was confused that I was not calling her. And then my client was confused because she thought the listing agent was also her friend. Okay. And that was the biggest mistake she made was that she thought this listing agent was her friend when she doesn't have a fiduciary duty to the buyer. She has a fiduciary duty to her client as the seller. Okay. They're not, they're not your friend. So you know, that I think that there can be some problems with boundaries of you need to understand who represents you and be very clear on that. Um, so what happens if you go to an open house without your agent? Well, if you want my representation and you know that like, am I going to be your agent? Then I would let whoever's there know that yes, I am representing you. What happens if you walk into a new development without your agent? Again, we are working with an agent. We're here touring. We're like a year out. We're six months out. Or no, we're just looking. And yes, we have been talking with an agent. So we do have representation um, if we decide to proceed, right? There are ways of telling them that you're working with somebody or you have someone that you want to work with. So what happens if I'm out of town, unavailable, or on vacation to show you a home? Well, if you are my client, meaning that you have signed agency with me, and we've gone and entered into a buyer broker. I now have a fiduciary duty to you, right? So if I'm on vacation, I'm unable to show you a home, right? We want to see a home. It always happens on like Christmas Eve at 4 p.m., right? Um, so there are ways. So usually with my clients, I kind of let them know my schedule. 
Hey, I'm going to be out of town. If there's something that pops on the market, please let me know. I'll be very responsive to you, text with you, email with you. I can always call the listing agent, have them do a video for me. I could also um, reach out to another team member who um, could run over there and show the property. Um, so there's ways of doing it. If I'm out of town or on vacation, if you are not my client and you're just a customer and you just found me on YouTube and you're going to send me a text at eight o'clock at night asking me about, um, 10 different homes, then, you know, it might take me a little while to get back to you, right? You're, I'm not, I don't represent you quite yet. Um, and we haven't had a chance to sit down and do a buyer consultation and, you know, I may or may not be present. I've had a few people, a few instances where people were like rubbed the wrong way that I was going to be out of town when they were flying into town. And I was like, you're mad at me already? Like, I don't even represent you. I'm sorry. Like, you literally just told me, you literally just found out about me 24 hours ago, called me, and now you're expecting, you're telling me when you're going to be here. But, you know, I, my schedule gets really full really quickly. And so sometimes I could be here, sometimes I couldn't. So just kind of, you know, expectation wise, don't be mad at me if I'm like out of town when you fly in here and you know, you're not my client and you never told me the dates you were flying in. And you tell me two days before you're coming to town, like I had no time to plan for you even coming in. And, you know, I don't even know, like, are we, are you my client? Are you not my client? So, you know, we just need, we need to, um, you know, please just keep that in mind as well. So, you know, have you written any other offers on a property in the last year? Have you signed a buyer broker with another agent in the last year? Have you walked into any new developments, galleries, or, you know, sales offices with builders such as Ivory Homes, Homes Homes, Lennar Homes, um, gone to Red Ledges, gone to Tuhay, gone to um, Promontory, right? I need to know if you've written any offers with any other agents in the past year. I also need to know if you've written any offers on homes with other agents because these contracts, like I'm going to have to look that over and make sure that, you know, ethically I could step in and represent you because if I can't, because you're still under contract with this person, even if you cancel the contract with them, um, or it expired, um, you know, there could still be properties depending on what they put in that contract, you know, if it was just based off properties or if it was based off a county, that they would be protected on getting paid for. So if you saw a house with them and didn't end up buying it, and then you're either you canceled with them or your contract expired, but then you end up wanting to go back and buy that property, there could be a chance that, you know, I wouldn't be able to help you because I I wouldn't get paid on that property. So just keeping in mind, like, I always think it's a really good idea to pick an agent and stay loyal to them. You know, really take your time to interview one, do your due diligence about them, make sure you fully trust them, that their personality is going to click with yours. Um, if you have questions about any of the stuff, I would love to go really, really deep with you. So, you know, if you want to become a client and not just a customer and you're interested in buying or selling a property here in Park City, Utah, then please let's book a Zoom consultation and let's go deep. And I'd love to I'd love to get to know who I'm talking to more. Um, 